Did the Master Chief, the Arbiter, the Rookie, Noble Six, Locke, or the Spirit of Fire's crew find the terminals and data logs hidden throughout each Halo game? Canonically, did they actually read or watch their contents? For games like Halo 3, this question is much easier to answer, but what about the added terminals in Halo CE or Halo 2? I'm inclined to think the answer, in most cases, is yes, and here's why. Before we get into the video, I'd like to take a quick moment and ask you to subscribe. I'm a small channel and I need all the support I can get so I can make more content like this. Okay, thanks. Back to the video. November 15th, 2011 marked the 10-year anniversary of Halo Combat Evolved, the original Halo title. As a way to celebrate, the new studio behind Halo's creation, previously Bungie, now 343 Industries, released Halo Combat Evolved Anniversary. The goal behind this game's creation was to modernize the game's graphics while keeping the original feel, leaving the mechanics and game design unaltered. With the click of a button, you can swap between the original looks and a set of newer, higher resolution textures. This wasn't the only change to the game though. As an incentive for old time Halo fans to re-experience the campaign and add a feeling of discovery and freshness, new collectibles were added to each level while the anniversary graphics were enabled. They took the form of skulls, which functioned as unlockable modifiers that altered the way the game behaved, such as infinite ammo or the inability to use covenant weapons. Skulls were in every Halo game after Combat Evolve's release, so it only made sense for them to be added retroactively. They also wanted to add some additional story to this 10 year game, giving lore savvy folks like us a reason to experience the iconic campaign for the hundredth time. Hidden within each level is a cutscene that can be accessed via a terminal. These terminals were not only created as a way for old Halo lore fans to absorb some new story, but they were also created to build hype and help bridge some narrative gaps to Halo 4, which was currently in development at 343 Industries. There are four types of terminals in Halo CE and every level contains at least one of these four. There's two human terminals, one covenant terminal, one flood terminal, and six forerunner terminals. Each of these hidden data files will play a cinematic that contains new story details. For the most part, they're from the perspective of 343 Guilty Spark after the firing of the Halo Array 100,000 years before the Pillar of Autumn would eventually arrive at his ring. It seems like the storytellers at 343 Industries intentionally went out of their way to make sure each terminal's contents would actually and realistically be in the locations that you find them. This seems to mostly be the case in every game after CE as well. You won't find a comprehensive journal detailing the Covenant's ancient history on Earth, or a personal journal from 343 Guilty Spark on a UNSC ship, for example. The contents of each data file are usually contextualized by wherever they're hidden. The first mission in Halo CE takes place entirely within the UNSC ship, the Pillar of Autumn, so the terminal hidden here would need to actually contain information that would be found within that environment. Its contents are a message from 343 Guilty Spark sent to the human spacecraft. In this message, he speaks directly to the ship's crew, first warning them not to approach, until he realizes they're human and disables all of the ring's defensive countermeasures. The terminal can be found right here in the captain's cabin on a nearby computer screen that flashes red and reads incoming message. The contents of this terminal make perfect sense for this location and it's likely that Cortana, Keys, the officers in its vicinity, and even the chief were aware of its contents. There's literally no reason why they wouldn't be. This is a direct message, the entire purpose of which is to be received and understood. The second terminal is located on Halo's surface within one of the many passageways that make up Halo's subsystems. It, like many of the other terminals throughout Halo CE, seems to be akin to a personal journal left behind by 343 as a means to catalog his time in isolation on the ring. It would make sense for him to do this given his desire to follow protocol and collect data. Any scientifically minded individual records their studies, findings, and thoughts. Every terminal found on the surface of the Halo is similar in its contents, each one detailing some of the events that Spark lived through after the firing of the Halo Array many millennia ago. Journaling is a good way to remain grounded, something that 343 was well aware he desperately needed to do. In his time alone, his mind had started to deteriorate and reminders of the past as well as his purpose could help him stay focused on the task assigned to him. He still needed to protect the ring and ensure it didn't fall into the hands of the Flood. 343 directly comments on this in the fourth terminal, stating, I am aware of the dangers of a system such as myself losing operational focus. Quite troubling. The third terminal is another interesting example of its contents perfectly synergizing with the environment it's located in. This one is hidden on board the Covenant ship, the Truth and Reconciliation, and is actually a conversation between 343 Guilty Spark and one of the Covenant's extremely limited AIs. It seems that 343 entered the ship at one point, perhaps not physically, but through some kind of computer system, and had a conversation with the ship's onboard AI. This construct was uncooperative with 343's pleads to communicate with its creators and stop them from unleashing the Flood. 
likely thanks to its intentionally limited design. The Covenant believed sophisticated AIs were sacrilegious thanks to their misinterpretation of certain forerunner warnings of artificial minds being controlled by the Flood. Perhaps this is why the Chief and Cortana are so nonchalant about their initial encounters with 343. You'd think they would at least be surprised by the Monitor's sudden appearance, but no. An ancient alien intelligence is a groundbreaking discovery. Even in the novelization of Halo CE, the Flood, which is canon by the way, he doesn't seem all that surprised of 343's existence. Perhaps at this point, he was already quite familiar with the AI. If he'd been watching all of these journals, he'd have a pretty decent idea what was going on and who Spark was. None of the terminals found before 343 betrays the Chief and Cortana actually mention the true purpose of the Halo rings either. Nothing within these journals explicitly details the effect the ring has on non-flood biomass until after 343 betrays the Chief. With all of this in mind, Chief following 343, taking him at his word, and almost activating the Halo array makes perfect sense. Based on the information contained within the terminals, Halo was clearly and successfully used to eliminate an ancient flood threat. It also helps that the Chief sort of knows 343 at this point, thanks to all of the journals he stumbled upon. He also knows that 343 has an intimate understanding of the flood, and obviously the technology the ring consists of. 343 didn't exactly give the Chief much of a choice other than follow him when he was transported to the library, but considering everything that goes on, it's a bit of a mystery why Chief sort of just takes his word for things. However, if the Chief had viewed the contents of the terminals, following Spark is clearly the most logical thing to do. It's not until the mission keys that things become a little harder to explain. In this mission, the terminal is found aboard the Truth and Reconciliation, directly underneath the Flood's proto-grave mine containing Captain Keys. Its contents are horrific, and because of that, it's easily one of the coolest and most heartbreaking cutscenes in the entire series. It takes place within the mind of Keys as it's slowly invaded by the Flood. You get to watch as he progressively loses his humanity and the infection takes him over completely. But how could an internal mental struggle between the Flood and Captain Keys make its way onto a physical terminal for the Chief to discover? I think I have an explanation. The Flood is a hive mind, essentially one superorganism that extends its body into various locations as puppets of its will. Every Flood form you encounter is connected via what appears to be some kind of telepathy, also known as neural physics. It can communicate wirelessly to other Flood-controlled bodies far away from the centralized intelligence, despite no real physical connections of any kind. There's actually in-game examples of the Gravemind making use of a similar concept by communicating with the Chief telepathically. The Flood has also proven that one of its main strategies is to demoralize its opponents through fear and intimidation, often speaking through the bodies of someone's loved one to convey a message of hopelessness. The Flood is inevitable and your consumption is all but unavoidable, so on and so forth. My guess is, using this strange means of communication, a physical data center of some kind was wirelessly injected with the mental exchange between the Flood and Captain Keys. But why? Likely so the Chief would discover it. There's no question whatsoever that the Chief is a force to be reckoned with, and any psychological advantage over him would be the key to his defeat. The Flood is cunning, and showing the Chief Keys' internal battle and inevitable fall to the Flood would not only sadden him greatly, but likely instill fear into him as well. Keys was the Chief's friend, one might even say a father figure, a man he looked up to and greatly respected. If Keyes, a tremendously loyal man notorious for his ability to keep a secret for his allies, was unable to resist the probing of the Flood hive mind, then surely no one could. The death of Jacob Keyes really affected the Chief. Even long after his death, during the events of Halo Infinite, you can hear the reverence in the Chief's voice when he speaks about him. You can hear the sadness of that loss. Who was that? Captain Jacob Keyes. The Pillar of Autumn was his ship. What happened to him? He's gone. Lost on the first ring we found. Maybe it's not just because they were allies and friends, but because the Chief had to watch as the man that he knew was slowly and torturously destroyed. This terminal scarred me when I first watched it. I can't even imagine how it would make the Chief feel. The final terminal found on the Maw, which takes place on the Pillar of Autumn once again, is another journal from 343 Guilty Spark, but this one is different from all of the others. This one was recorded very recently, which explains why it can be found on the ship instead of on the surface of the ring. In it, 343 speaks of the Chief's recent actions, destroying everything on his path to victory, eventually including the very ring itself. Much like Halo CE, Halo 2 contains three different kinds of terminal. You can find three human terminals, six Forerunner terminals, and four Covenant terminals for a total of 13. The first three data files you find in Halo 2 are on Cairo Station and Earth. 
Their contents reflect this, each containing a piece of a profile on Thelvatomy, or the Arbiter, created by none other than Jameson Locke. Upon opening these three data files, a screen requesting identification displays, at which point the chief appears to enter his credentials and is granted access to their contents. This is the first and biggest piece of evidence that suggests the chief actually did find these. He obviously possesses a higher level of clearance than your average Marine, so it makes sense he would be granted access to this information. At the time, Locke obviously wouldn't be a Spartan yet. He wasn't recruited into the Spartan IV program until 2556, four years after the events of Halo 1 through 3. When this profile was created, he was a lieutenant commander, which further cements the possibility that these three terminals were actually physically placed in the locations, and that there's really no reason why Chief couldn't have viewed the information within them. After the events of Halo CE, 343 made his way to a gas mine in the orbit of a nearby gas giant, Threshold. There, he would find a contingent of Covenant soldiers tasked with researching the enigmatic station, led by an elite individual named Sesa Rafumi. Once you're put into the shoes of Thelvatomy, or Arbiter, you're tasked with eliminating these now ex-Covenant soldiers who have decided to rebel against their previously held ideals. This rebellion was created thanks to a conversation Sesa had with 343 Guilty Spark, which was an attempt by 343 to illuminate Sesa, and hopefully by extension, the rest of the Covenant, that their religion was rooted in fallacy. The terminals found here show exactly what their conversation was like and the details that 343 shared to convince Sesa of the truth. Why they're in this location is easily explained using the same explanation as most of the terminals throughout CE. As 343 spoke with Sesa, it's quite likely that he would record these conversations much like he had created personal journals of his time in isolation on his Halo ring. If he left journals of his experiences on the ring before and during CE, I see no reason why he wouldn't do the same here. It's worth mentioning that the terminals containing this conversation are the exact same design as the ones found in CE, furthering the idea that these were created by 343. These two terminals are discoverable while you're in the hooves of the Arbiter, so if he really did see them, they did little to dissuade him from his holy mission. It's unlikely that any amount of discussion would fully change the Arbiter's mind about his allegiances with the Covenant, but the terminals would, along with his confrontation with Sesa, unquestionably plant a seed of doubt firmly within Thel's mind. These aren't the only two data files pertaining to Sesa and 343's conversation. There are four others, three of which are theoretically also found by the Arbiter and are in locations that are a bit harder to explain. Instead of being on the threshold gas mine, they're found sporadically across the surface of Delta Halo. Up until this point, the contents of every terminal matched well with their locations, but a lot of these give me pause. Why would they be here? Perhaps the Covenant forces that acquired Spark also took his journals from the gas mine of Threshold? It would make sense, the Covenant loved taking Forerunner artifacts, and these terminals would likely be of great interest to them. Why'd they bring them on the surface of Delta Halo? I can't say. Their contents border on heresy, and any evidence that suggested the Great Journey was a lie would have been kept hidden by the Prophets. Maybe they were collected by a Sesa sympathizer that planned to show his conversation to other members of the Covenant in hopes of turning more against the Great Journey? I think the most likely explanation is actually none of the above. I think 343 was somehow able to transmit them to the surface of Delta Halo. We know he had communications with this ring while he was on Installation 04. He says so in the CE terminals. It's not outrageous to think he'd still be able to communicate with its systems from the gas mine either, given the gas mine's relative close proximity to Installation 04. Maybe he transmitted this conversation to key locations on Delta Halo in hopes that others within the Covenant, like Sesa, would see them and rebel against the Covenant group's religious nonsense. The Forerunners were an extremely advanced civilization, so it should be very easy for Spark to transmit data from one terminal to another. The first of the data files located on the surface of Delta Halo is clearly of Covenant design. Its contents are all about their ancient history, and it's located in a room full of Covenant forces. The recalled events contained within these Covenant terminals are slightly distorted because they're from a modern day Minor Prophet's perspective. He recounts moments from their history in a collection of short historical and opinion-based write-ups he's titled The Record of Punished Deeds. How did the contents of his document arrive at any of the locations spread across Delta Halo when it's clear that he's located on High Charity? I'd wager that this terminal and the one found by the Arbiter on Sacred Icon were brought by the Covenant individuals on the ring, either for entertainment or educational purposes. Perhaps this record was akin to a podcast, something that when published was accessible from Covenant terminals for anyone to listen. The other two Covenant terminals are found within the Covenant's megacity, High Charity, which makes their location much easier to explain compared to the others. Both contain another piece of the Punished Deeds document. This prophet scribe's final terminal steps away from ancient history and recalls the recent destruction of Installation 04 in CE. 
After briefly reiterating these events, he discusses the dangers that Thel Vadami poses for the Greater Covenant, stating that if it were up to him, Thel would have been executed. He admits that he believes the Arbiter's continued survival is very dangerous, and he fears the Covenant will inevitably fall should he continue to survive. It's this last terminal that leads me to believe this document is somewhat like a kind of journalistic piece for the average Covenant citizen to listen to. There are only two types of terminals in Halo 3, Forerunner Terminals and Cortana's Terminal. Their contents are always relevant to the location because they're located on the surface of the Ark and the newly formed Halo ring that appears in the end of Halo 3. Most of the content contained within these are text files of communications between Mendicant Bias, an ancient and all-powerful Forerunner AI, and the Primordial, the first grave mind and last surviving precursor. The Precursors were a race more ancient and somehow more technologically advanced than even the Forerunners. The other terminals are conversations between the Didact and the Librarian during the waning days of the Forerunner Flood War. The third terminal is the only one that contains a modern conversation between 343 Guilty Spark and the Monitor of the Ark, 000 Tragic Solitude. It's also the first hint that the Chief is actually interacting with these strange screens. If you open the terminal up, after a few moments, you'll be rerouted from the conversation between Spark and Solitude, and it will display a message specifically for the Chief, stating, I see you, Reclaimer. Upon opening the fourth terminal and allowing some time to pass, Mendicant Bias will once again speak straight to the Chief, saying, I have found the shard that was lost. They brought it back to me. Now my reconstitution cannot be stopped. This is referencing the Forerunner Dreadnought that had previously been on High Charity, which contained a fragment of the AI's consciousness. Thanks to the ship's arrival on the Ark, this piece of mendicant bias was reunited with another fragment that had been long buried somewhere deep beneath the Ark's surface. The fifth terminal is a series of messages from mendicant bias sent to the Forerunners after its eventual fall to the Flood. Through conversation, the Primordial was able to convince mendicant bias that the Flood wasn't the true evil, that they only sought to unite the universe as one, and the Forerunners had no right to stop them. This terminal also eventually leads to Mendicant Bias acknowledging the Chief with him saying, the daemons are not taking a kind view of your presence here. They don't want me speaking to you. A daemon is a background process that handles requests for services such as print spooling and file transfers and is dormant when not required. So some kind of subsystem within the Ark was attempting to stop Mendicant Bias from speaking to the Chief. Perhaps it was Tragic Solitude, the aforementioned monitor of the Ark, it's possible, but likely just some form of a more simplistic countermeasure put into place by the Forerunners to prevent anyone from communicating with Mendicant. The sixth terminal contains yet another acknowledgement to Chief from Mendicant. Once it reroutes you from the first lines of text, he says, I win. This is Mendicant fully taking control, no longer allowing the daemons to impede his progress and stop him from communicating with the Chief. The final Forerunner terminal is on the surface of the replacement Halo ring that was contained within the Ark's forges. This is the only terminal in the game that you interact with while in possession of Cortana. She comments on the strange construct when you approach it, saying, Wait, what's that? So not only do these terminals regularly speak to the chief, but now someone outside of them has acknowledged their existence. Like many of the others before it, this too contains a message from Mendicant Bias. After a bit of time passes, it redirects the chief to new information with the message, I'll tell you who I am. I am Mendicant Bias. This is what I have done. The text on screen now is the final message from Mendicant Bias to Chief and reads, You don't know the contortions I had to go through to follow you here, Reclaimer. I know what you're here for. What position do I take? Will I follow one betrayal with another? You're going to say I'm making a habit of turning on my masters, but the one that destroyed me long ago in the upper atmosphere of a world far distant from here was an implement far cruder than I. My weakness was capacity, unintentional though it was, to choose the Flood, a mistake my makers would not soon forgive. But I want something far different from you, Reclaimer. Atonement. And so here at the end of my life, I do once again betray a former master. The path ahead is fraught with peril, but I will do all I can to keep it stable, keep you safe. I'm not so foolish to think this will absolve me of my sins. One life hardly balances billions, but I would have my masters know that I have changed, and you shall be my example. If direct acknowledgement isn't convincing enough for you, page 161 of an official Halo book titled Halo Mythos directly confirms that Chief gathered the information contained within the terminals of Halo 3, stating, Data retrieved from the Dawn's internal systems showed that while the Chief was on the Ark installation, he encountered several terminals. 
From these records, stories emerged, shedding light on the Forerunner's final days before the activation of Halo. We can also look to Halo Legends for evidence. In the beginning of this anthology series, Cortana summarizes the final days of the Forerunner Flood War, using information she could only possess if the Chief gathered these terminals. I don't think it could be any more plain than that. The Chief undoubtedly found and interacted with all of these terminals. The only data file that I haven't mentioned in Halo 3 is the Cortana Terminal. It's located on the mission with the same name and is a reference to a moment in the novel, The Fall of Reach. I don't see why the Chief wouldn't have collected this either, but I'm not entirely sure what its purpose is. It was most likely left here by Gravemind for the same purpose as the terminal in CE, to demoralize the Chief, to make him feel hopeless that Cortana was already too far gone. If we assume the Chief had been collecting the terminals up until this point, the Gravemind was probably aware that the Chief was loosely familiar with Mendicant's turn to the Flood. This terminal implies the same process was taking place with Cortana, making it seem as though she had already lost her sanity. Since the Chief was forced to leave her aboard High Charity in the events of Halo 2, the Gravemind was free to probe her with questions. During this time, the parasitic hive mind attempted to do the same thing he did with Mendicant to Cortana, infect her with the Logic Plague, and turn her against her former allies, in this case, humanity. The terminals in Halo 3 ODST are a bit different than the ones I've talked about so far. Not only are they strictly audio rather than video or text, but they actually alter one of the cutscenes towards the end of the game and unlock an otherwise inaccessible room. This means that collecting them actually changes things in-game, providing concrete evidence that the rookie did indeed listen to them. His actions are directly affected by an understanding only obtained by listening to all 30. Each story segment is hidden somewhere in the open portions of the Mombasa streets, save for the final, which is on Data Hive and only appears if the other 29 have been gathered before it. The story of the audio files follows a young woman named Sadie Andesha as she tries to make contact with her father in the wake of the initial Covenant invasion. On her journey, she has to deal with the Covenant and a host of incredibly corrupt police officers. But Sadie isn't some random civilian. She's the daughter of Daniel and Desha, a man responsible for designing and maintaining key security software for the entire city, and an expert when it comes to the creation of artificial intelligence. He had created an AI that would serve as the city's superintendent, which contained a special subroutine specifically made to monitor the whereabouts of his daughter. It's through this monitoring that most of the audio files are recorded. This AI, though rudimentary when compared to someone like Cortana, was capable of tapping into seemingly any electronic device throughout the city. Security cameras, medical kiosks, phones, you name it. As the rookie wanders the dark and damp roadways, the superintendent would intentionally lead him to each and every audio file in hopes that Sadie's story would be known. This AI is also responsible for providing the in-game map data and other useful information that helped the rookie navigate the maze-like city. It's easy to explain how the audio files ended up within many of the electronic devices throughout the city. Virgil, the name given to the subroutine designed to watch over Sadie, had full dominion over the city's technology, so uploading simple audio files would be a very easy thing to accomplish. If you're able to locate all 29 audio files in the city, a new encounter triggers in the mission Data Hive the rookie will eventually come face to face with a police officer who is mysteriously traveling deep beneath the metropolis. Coincidentally, the same place the rookie needs to go. If you don't collect all 29 audio logs on the streets, this police officer is killed by a swarm of drones. But canonically, that's not really what happened. If you have collected all of the audio files on the streets before starting the mission, he'll lead you into a normally locked room and upon entering, attempt to kill you, fearing that you'll expose the attempted cover up of the murder of Sadie's father. Of course, the rookie doesn't take this too kindly and kills him in self-defense. Once the officer is dead, the rookie is free to listen to the 30th and final audio file. A bit later into the mission and you'll reach Veronica Dare and together finally meet Virgil, who has now been assimilated by a Huragak or engineer named Quick to Adjust. Depending on whether or not you collected all of the audio files, the rookie's reaction to the Huragak varies greatly. It's better if I just show you this rather than explain. Don't shoot. We've seen them before on other ops, but we've never gotten this close. We've seen them before on other ops, but we've never gotten this close. 
If all of this evidence is somehow not good enough for you, an official Halo book titled Halo The Essential Visual Guide directly confirms that the rookie did indeed learn of Sadie's story by collecting all of the audio files. On page 160, it says, Accessing various terminals in New Mombasa, the rookie learned of a civilian named Sadie Andesha and of her search for her father. Halo Wars might be very different compared to every other Halo game from a gameplay perspective, but that doesn't mean it doesn't have its own form of lore-based collectible. In this case, it's the timeline, which functions precisely how you'd expect. Each piece of the timeline is unlocked by completing various tasks in the game, such as finishing a match on a specific multiplayer map, or finding a collectible in campaign. The contents of the timeline itself are undoubtedly canon, that's their entire purpose. Some of them are actually part of the same document that I mentioned composed some of the Halo 2 terminals, the Punished Deeds. The author of the entries included in the Halo Wars timeline is unknown, but it's possible that it was the same profit from Halo 2's terminals. One entry in particular references Regret's ascendance to high profit and is noted as occurring in the year 2525. It reads, The youngest of the new prophets, Regret, ascended by manipulating and blackmailing those around him. Regret was one of the prophets who visited the Oracle, an ancient AI where it was learned that the humans were somehow connected to the Forerunner race and that the very foundation of the Covenant belief was flawed. Their decision to eradicate humanity to hide these facts is debated to this day. While yes, Regret did become a hierarch in the year 2525, the information regarding humanity having ties to the Forerunners was carefully kept hidden. Only Truth, Mercy, and Regret were privy to this knowledge. If this were to somehow leak beyond the Three Sin Shayum, the Covenant would have likely fallen apart much sooner. So there's no way this commentary was actually written in the year 2525. This date must only refer to the year in which Regret's ascension took place. This timeline entry also contains the second reference to the Punished Deeds and further confirms my suspicions that the terminals within Halo 2 are actually in-universe documents written by a journalist. This may imply that Halo 2's Prophet Scribe somehow survived the fall of High Charity, otherwise this entry into the Punished Deeds wouldn't have been recorded assuming this wasn't written by someone else entirely. Some of these timeline entries, as I previously mentioned, are obtained by finding and collecting campaign collectibles, which are called black boxes. In real life, a black box is actually orange and a required component for any aircraft. They contain any and all flight data, such as radio transmissions or sounds from the cockpit. In game, they're actually black and clearly human in design, each containing various bits of information. Many of the timeline entries unlocked through black boxes are UNSC related, so their contents make perfect sense. Others, however, contain timeline entries pertaining to the Covenant, information that clearly shouldn't be inside of an obviously human designed object. Unless these black boxes don't actually contain the information that is unlocked on the timeline, I'm betting that these are simply just flight recorders from downed UNSC aircraft, and that their associated unlocks are just a reward for the player and do not reflect their actual contents. If that's the case, then I see no reason why the Spirit of Fire's crew couldn't have collected them. Tons of aircraft were destroyed in the Halo Wars campaign, ranging from Hornets to Vultures, each of which should contain a black box. Even at locations undiscovered by humanity, such as the Shield World from later in the game, it's easy to explain why there would be black boxes here, as air vehicles could have easily been destroyed over the course of each mission. There aren't any terminals hidden throughout Halo Reach. Instead, there are data pads, which are text-based collectibles contained on small, paper-sized pieces of technology that are designed to contain information. There are a total of 19, and each contains details about a clandestine group of AIs called the Assembly. These AIs supposedly influence humanity from the shadows, guiding them onto the correct path across a time span of a few hundred years. The contents of these data pads are fascinating, but their validity is questionable. No one knows if the information within them is actually true. What we do know for sure is that Noble Six found and read each and every one of them. How do we know this? A forerunner being by the name of Catalog, whose sole purpose was to gather any and all information for historical preservation, outright confirmed it. Thanks to the incredibly advanced technology of the forerunners, Catalog was able to tap into human and covenant information repositories to further increase its knowledge base. One small tidbit of the information acquired was the fact that Noble Six actually found these strange pieces of information. In the real world, fans would take to the Halo Waypoint forums online to ask Catalog questions about Halo's story, and if they were lucky, Catalog would answer them. One individual wanted more information regarding these enigmatic data pads, and Catalog was happy to oblige, stating, The purported assembly is referenced in logs recovered by Spartan B-312 during combat operations on Reach. 
This organization appears to be a group of rogue AI constructs which have been observing and guiding humanity. The reliability of this information has been contested. Each of Catalog's answers is considered canon, so that's about as direct confirmation as you could possibly get. One of the first files that you can find is actually in the possession of an elite. This Sangheili only appears on legendary difficulty, and if you're unable to kill him quickly, he'll vanish. If you do manage to take him out, he'll drop the first of many data pads. If Noble Six canonically found and read these data pads, which he absolutely did, that means this elite's presence and subsequent death at the hands of Noble Team should also be canon. This begs the question, why does this elite want the data pad? What is so interesting to him about its contents? Clearly, he believes the information within it is true, otherwise he wouldn't be risking his life to acquire the device. The only issue with this is that this sort of spoils that the Covenant are on reach prior to Noble Team actually confirming it. Perhaps the timing of this encounter was slightly off, and Noble Six simply dispatched the Elite a little later? This is possible, considering the exact enemy count and combat strategies employed by protagonists in-game is intentionally kept a bit vague. So, for the sake of brevity, let's just assume Six and Co. killed this particular split chin a few minutes later. Collectibles in Halo 4 are, once again, fully animated cutscenes which are accessed through terminals. Their contents are presented quite similarly to the ones found in Halo CE and Halo 2, but their design more closely resembles the ones found in Halo 3. Each cinematic takes place in the distant past. Much like Halo 3's terminals, these are some of the final moments of the Forerunner Flood War, typically from the perspective of the Didact or the Librarian. These consoles are placed all across various Forerunner installations, and even though they may not look identical, they're essentially the same things the Chief spoke to Mendigan Bias through in Halo 3. Cortana actually makes a comment about these as well. This node is caught in a loop trying to access something it's calling the Domain. An off-world data repository of some kind, though I'm only able to extract bits and pieces of the complete exchange. I'll log it for investigation later. The domain is so massive in scale and scope that even the Forerunners weren't completely aware of its full capabilities. It's within this sea of knowledge that these bits of information are stored and subsequently accessed through these terminals. It's extremely easy to explain why the terminals exist in the locations you find them. All of them are found on either Requiem or a landmass removed straight from the Halo Ring, both of which are obviously Forerunner constructs. Naturally, there'd be Forerunner machines containing information there. Why are these particular conversations stored in this specific location, though? The domain is a mysterious machination, something even the precursors made use of. Most Forerunners believed it was a thinking being in of itself, only showing them information most relevant to certain situations. Obviously, information regarding the Didact and his mission before the firing of the Halo Array was incredibly pertinent to the Chief and Cortana. It's because of this that it's possible the domain intentionally showed the duo these events, to help them gain a better understanding of their opponent. It's also a possibility that the Chief simply collected the information but didn't watch the same terminals we see as he collected them. Maybe he was able to analyze the data later? Page 198 of the official publication Halo Mythos states, He had learned that the legacy of the Forerunners and their mantle had a dark side to it. They achieved peace and stability by sacrificing freedom. How would Chief know any of this if he wasn't privy to the fact that the Forerunners had devolved humanity in an attempt to retain peace? He wouldn't. The only way he'd know any of this is if he was aware of the information contained within the terminals. Halo 5 has 117 different lore collectibles, each of which are contextualized by their location. I'm not gonna go over every single collectible hidden throughout Halo 5 because that would take far too long. But I will say this, I do believe both the Chief and Locke found each and every one. Human-related logs are found in human-related areas. Covenant logs in Covenant areas. Forerunner logs in Forerunner areas. I think you get the idea. There's no reason why they can't be here, and there's no reason why the protagonists wouldn't have checked them out. Yes, even including the Sangheili love letter to Palmer.
Halo Wars 2 has a bunch of different text-based collectibles called Phoenix Logs. They function very similarly to the timeline entry seen in the first Halo Wars game, except this time around, they're not strictly part of a linear set of events. Some of these Phoenix Logs simply describe a specific type of unit or building and are obtained by just playing certain facets of the game. The Phoenix Logs I want to discuss are the ones that are actually found as in-game collectibles. Did the Spirit of Fire's crew or Atriox's Banished actually pick these up? And if they did, was the information contained within them the same lore information that is subsequently unlocked for us to read? The first thing I want to bring up is the bizarre nature of their appearance. Look at this thing. I have no idea what it's meant to represent. It reminds me of the Forerunner cores from the final mission of Halo 5. Clearly, they're neither UNSC nor Banished in design. Their contents vary from personal logs to field reports from both the UNSC and the Banished forces. There are even a few from what appears to be the Monitor of the Ark. While I think it's completely and totally possible that each and every one of the Phoenix logs found within the campaign are found by whoever you're playing as, I don't think their appearance is necessarily canon. I'm guessing this strange design doesn't actually reflect their true canon design. If they do, maybe they're somehow related to the Forerunner Entity catalog? It's possible, but I can't be certain. Much like Halo 5, each and every collectible you find in Halo Infinite is contextualized by its location. There's absolutely no reason why they can't be wherever they're found. The most interesting are the Forerunner logs that can be found within all of these strange rings. The data collected is not only compiled by the weapon for the Chief to listen to, but she directly comments on their contents as well. This data is strange. I'm not even certain all of it is Forerunner, strictly speaking. Strands of this code are older than Zeta Halo itself. Possibly older than the Forerunners themselves. For all we know about them, there's so much we don't. Once again, like Halo 5, there are a ton of audio files hidden within Halo Infinite's campaign, and I'm not going to go over them all. This video is already way too long as it is. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here simply because they're a lot easier to explain as canon when compared to some of the other game's collectibles. So, in the end, that's why I think the Chief... Arbiter, the Rookie, Noble Six, Locke, the Spirit of Fire's crew, and Atriox's Banished did in fact find and collect all of each game's terminals and lore-based collectibles. There's really no reason why they wouldn't have. This video turned out to be a much bigger undertaking than I had initially planned, but I had fun re-experiencing some of the information contained within these more obscure pieces of Halo lore, especially the terminals in Halo 1 through 4. What do you think? What's your favorite set of in-game collectibles? Sound off in the comments, and while you're down there, leave a like and subscribe, please. I'm a small channel and I need all the support I can get so I can keep making content like this. Thanks for watching. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna go play some Halo.